In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. So our Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be continuing our series in 1 Samuel. And just to understand where they are in the story here, God has commanded Saul through the prophets to go and slay the Amalekites. So this is the charge that he's given, and he's told specifically, you, you have to destroy every aspect of their society. You destroy their, their king, you destroy all of their people, men, women, children, livestock, and of course, you know, to, to our modern ears, that sounds awful and horrible. They were engaging in some of these awful, horrible sins, and, and this is something that is a, cor a command given directly by God to the Israelites. It's, it's not as though the Israelites came up with this on their own. This is the commandment that God sends down to King Saul. And so that's what Saul was told to do. It's not what Saul did. See, what Saul did was he went into the Amalekites and the country that they were living in, and he brought back their king. So instead of destroying all of them like God told him to, he decided to bring back King Agag and do so as, as basically a trophy or a hostage or however you want to paint that. And he also didn't stop there. He also brought back all of the best livestock and brought them back too, even though he was supposed to destroy them as well. So that's the setting that we find ourselves in here in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 10 through 11. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel and said, Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret that I have not made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commandments. And Saul was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. A couple things that kind of jump out when you read this verse. First of all, the language that is used here, it acknowledges Saul's change. So instead of just giving commentary on what's going on specifically in the here and now, which of course is the primary focus of this verse, there is also several hints throughout this short passage of Scripture that God is not only focusing on Saul and what he is doing right now, that God is aware of and acknowledges that this is a change for Saul. Saul has not always been perfect. Saul has made several big mistakes that we've already seen in the scriptures here, but he's also done several really good things, things that are praiseworthy, things that God, things that God has been very pleased with Saul and his behavior in. And so that's not something that can be easily dismissed or ignored, and God doesn't do that. Just like any parent that has a child that is disobedient, God sees Saul and is sorry and upset that he's acting this way not only because it's a bad thing for him to act this way now, but also because God sees what he could have been and how Saul has been and has behaved in the past when he was more loyal to God. And so the, the language that's used here where it says, first of all, regret is a part of it, but he goes, he is turned back from following me. You know, well, turned back, you know, would indicate that he was following him at one time, and so this is really God kind of crying out and sad that Saul has chosen to behave the way that he has. And the lesson that I think that that says to us is we're not incapable of turning on God. We'd all like to think that we are. We would all really love to believe that once we become a Christian, once we are on God's side, that, that that's it, we're done, and, and we can just kind of cruise until the end. 
But that's not what Christianity looks like, and that's not the kind of Christianity that Christ talks about in the Gospels. He talks about it being a struggle and a fight. In fact, if you look at what God is saying and, and look at what Jesus says about following him, you could easily surmise correctly that it is going to be the hardest thing you've ever had to do. And he knew that. And so we can turn our backs on God. We can be in his good favor and then stop acting the way that we're supposed to. That's something that Jesus acknowledges. That's something that is acknowledged by the scripture here, that Saul at one time had God's favor, and that was because he was doing the things that God knew that he was supposed to do, and God commanded him to do those things. And then, as time went on, Saul got a little less concerned with doing what God wanted him to do, and he started letting some things slide, and he would do some things that uh, were technically in the right, but maybe motivated by the wrong thing. And, and then he moves into right here where he's just openly defying a direct order that God gave him. And he's trying to be sneaky about it and doesn't necessarily want to broadcast that he's doing that, but he's still willing to do it is the point. And that's what's so incredibly sad here. You see, we can't rest on having been good before. We can't just lay back and rest on our laurels and, and look at great things that we've accomplished in the past and say, look at all these things I've done for the kingdom. Well, first of all, get over yourself. The scripture says that even our great deeds are as filthy rags to God. I mean, we're just workmen. We're just doing the things that we're supposed to do. We're not necessarily doing anything astounding or worthy of some kind of great commendation when we're doing just the things that we're supposed to do the things that God commanded us, that's, that we're fulfilling our purpose. We're not doing anything extraordinary. And this is something that maybe that was part of the reason that Saul thought he could get away with some things. Because he not only got accustomed to getting his way as king, but he also maybe thought to himself, well, look at all the good things that I've done for Israel. I've helped deliver us from the Philistines. I, he put your, I think maybe he put himself in that mindset to where he was really thinking about it more from the standpoint of, well, I, I've done all these things, so surely I can sort of look at these, you know, these commands as, as more like guidelines and suggestions, and I can do a little bit more of what I want, and that's just not the way that God operates. And we'll see that later on in the story, it winds up biting Saul pretty badly. But I think it's also important to note here that the indication from the scripture is also that God and Samuel both are very sad about this. If you look at the way that it ends there, it says that I regret God talking there, that he had made Saul king. Now, it's important to note that God's regret and our regret, two completely different things. When we say we regret something, basically the sentiment we're conveying to other people is, boy, if I wish I had a time machine and I could go back and correct my mistake, yeah, I would. Not what's going on here. What God is essentially saying is he's sorrowful. And in fact, if you look at the Hebrew language in the writing that is given here, uh, th there's quite a bit of indication of that as well. Basically, that God is uh, experiencing sadness because of Saul being made king. Now, God actually could go back in time and correct his mistake if he really wanted to, and obviously he doesn't, which means that this was part of his plan, this was something that he knew that was going to happen even as he was making Saul king. But what it is trying to convey is that God has a very deep sadness for the way that Saul is behaving. And it says later on in the scripture that Samuel is distressed too, so much that he cried out to God all night long. You know, you look at that. God and Samuel didn't hate Saul. They didn't want him to fail. They weren't sort of the car caricature, cartoonish version of God that atheists like to pretend is going on here to where God is just kind of sitting there waiting to constantly thump people he doesn't like. That's not the indication we're given here at all. God is like a grieving parent that is looking at his child, openly defying him, doing things that he knows are bad for him, and, and seeing that it's something that he, he just wishes that Saul were better, and we're doing the things that he did when Saul was younger, 
and had more of a heart for God. And Samuel's the same way. Yes, Samuel's not God. Samuel's not really the parent figure here, but Samuel is a fellow follower of God. And he's the person that anointed King Saul, and he's really sad to see Saul that had so much promise and so much potential and did many wonderful things for the Lord has now turned into this. And that's the same kind of attitude that God has towards us when we turn away from Him. Especially in the books of poetry, you look back and you, you see the sort of imagery there of a parent walking with their young child at that, that time when they're a little bitty where they admire their parents and respect them and try to obey them. And then time goes on and they lose that reverence and they lose that passion and they lose that kind of childlike trust in God and start going off and doing their own thing, which leads to destruction. That's the kind of sentiment that is trying to be reflect here, reflected here, but I think that the sobering lesson that it gives to us is that God does, of course, help us out. He tries to help us and work His providence into our lives to where He can help save us from our mistakes for a little while, but eventually, no more. Eventually, He is going to let us fall prey to the consequences of our own actions. And most of the rest of the book of 1 Samuel is God allowing that very thing to happen to Saul. He is allowing Saul to reap that which he has sown. He protected Saul for a very long time. He blessed Saul, and even when Saul made mistakes, God tried to help him out, but when you get into the realm of open rebellion against something that God told you to do, that's at the point where God's going to let you face the consequences of your own actions. And if we want to avoid that, then we need to have that childlike trust in God that Saul had when he was a new king and, and when this relationship between him and God first started and he really had a heart for pleasing God and doing what he said. And if we can have that, then, then we'll have the same kind of good relationship with God that Saul had at the very beginning. That's a lifelong goal that we should be striving for. Stay the course, friends. My mother always said if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid. But seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm sure my mom would appreciate it.